Hey guys, uh, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. This is episode six of the Pallet Wood Door Build video series, and it includes a bunch of random stuff that needs to be done on this project before I go into the next phase, which is uh, going to be actually building the door. That's kind of exciting. Uh, I want to get into it, but there's quite a few uh, details that need to be done before that happens. Most of what I'm going to show in this video never makes it into HGTV video productions because it's kind of routine and somewhat mundane, but it's absolutely necessary for getting a good job done. Episode 5 wrapped up when I finished making the helical tapers on this uh, threshold, and since then I notched the ends out of the threshold and made interlocking notches in the bottom of the jam. Those are so job specific to this, I didn't go into a lot of detail, but you can see in these video clips some of the steps that were involved in getting that done. This panning shot shows careful layout on the threshold before it was varnished. This shot shows layout on the jam legs differing from the hinge side to the strike side because of the slope in the floor. Notching the threshold needed to be done with the top side against the fence. So the cuts would be perpendicular to the level plane of the top of the threshold, and not perpendicular to the sloped floor. Interlocking joinery for the threshold and bottoms of the jams is a little bit complicated, but careful planning and accurate cuts make this jam what it needs to be. The six degree slope of the floor shows up on the bottom of the jam legs because they were cut square. So I use a belt sander to shave off that little six degree imperfection. That way the jam will sit flat on the floor with no extra space between the threshold and concrete. I want to round off the two exposed sharp corners of the threshold. So I just take a socket and trace around it with a sharp writer pencil. This gives a nice curve that's easy to follow. Viewers are get a kick out of the fact that this is a metric radius because I'm using a metric socket. One of these days we'll make the switch. After tracing the radius I want, I just nip the corners off on the miter box. And then, back at the bench, I take one of my best blocks for demanding sanding, of course one first, and quickly sand to the radius line sketched with the socket. And then I take a smoother belt to refine the curve and remove scratches. And use that same belt to ease the sharp edges on the end of the threshold to get the refined look on the cut end of the threshold that I'm after. I had trouble shooting video of applying the first bit of varnish to the top of the threshold, but you can see the transformation that I get using this old master's gel polyurethane on the bottom of the threshold, where it changes the dull natural wood into the rich color of ash with a coat of varnish on it. I apply a number of coats to the top of the threshold too, and let everything soak in good before I buff it off. And you can see what the threshold looks like with that coat of varnish soaking in in this panning shot. With all the mechanics of fitting and attaching the threshold to the jam and assembling the jam complete, I need to do the cosmetic part to finish up the jam so that I can install it. The cosmetics involve repairing some uh, natural defects in the cherry that this jam is made out of and then easing the edges before I sand it and apply a finish. Where the finish is concerned, I mentioned a number of times that I was going to put a waterborne polyurethane finish on this but I since decided to use the gel polyurethane that I used on the threshold. The reason for that is uh, it's an interior door, so I don't need the durability of that uh, waterborne exterior spar varnish. Uh, this finish is a lot nicer to the touch. I'm going to be going in and out of this door a lot, and so I want that. And with all the stuff that I've got to haul in and out of the door, it's bound to get dinged up, and it's much easier to repair a gel varnish finish to touch that up than it would be to sand and respray it periodically to keep it looking nice. So I switched that up. So I'll have to cover applying waterborne polyurethane varnish in a different video. This inclusion of bark is the most visible defect in the jam. I don't mind it cosmetically, but the wood is weak because it's split. So I'm going to infill this to make it smooth and stable. And I'll use Starbond CA glue to do this quickly and easily. A couple pieces of masking tape will keep the glue from running down the face of the jam where it's just more trouble to clean up later. I'll start with the medium Starbon CA for this repair and begin by spraying the area with an accelerator so that the CA dries from the outside or from the inside out. 
on a deep repair like this, I don't want the CA to set too fast because it will tend to foam and bubble. And I want this repair to be clear because this application of CA is so thick, it takes a while for it to set up from the inside out, but it's doing nicely. I add a little more accelerator and then apply a second coat to fill out the deepest part of the repair. It doesn't take long for the surface to harden, but because this repair is so deep, I'll give it a good five or 10 minutes to make sure it's set up all the way through. That's untypical of CA glue, which when applied in thin layers, takes 10 seconds or less to set up. But the deepest part of this repair is over an eighth of an inch. There's still one little low spot on this end. So I'll add a third coat just to make sure it's level and full. And once the surface cures and I'm done applying glue, I can remove the masking tape while this sets up the rest of the way. While that CA glue is setting up good and hard, I'm gonna tackle the embarrassing part of this install, and that is making this rough opening wider. If you remember from a previous episode, I made this opening for an exterior style door jam with regular hinges, and there's a half inch shim space on each side, but because I made this door jam extra thick and a little bit wide, because I'm using invisible hinges, I've got a increase the opening size so there's shim space left in here. And I'm gonna do that uh, because it's a non-structural wall. I'm gonna take out the inch and a half trimmer stud or cripple and replace it with a three quarter inch one. That extra three quarters of an inch will give me enough room to install the frame. This sheetrock is attached with screws. I know that because I did it myself. So I wanna remove the screws from here so that I can get the stud out and trim the sheetrock back. And the easiest way to locate and remove the screws starts with a racketeer stud ball magnet. These stud ball magnets are super strong and the little dongle on them helps to maneuver them around where they easily stick to a screw head buried under the taping mud. The magnet leaves a little dark mark right where the screw head is when the magnet's dirty. And then I take a Phillips tip out of a drywall screw gun, which has a finer point, and pull the screw out because I know exactly where it is. Even when the Phillips tip has to dig around a little bit to find a screw head, this is really quick and easy to do. I did a whole video a while back showing uh, this tip along with a bunch of others for surgical removal of sheetrock. The link to that video is here and it involves that stud ball magnet and there's a link in the Amazon description below where you can find these magnets if you can't find them locally. FYI, the Amazon price on these is actually kind of high compared to what I can get them for at a local uh, contractor sheetrock place. So you might check those first before you go to Amazon. But even at Amazon's price, these little magnets are super useful and well worth the money. But don't tell Jeff Bezos they're cheap at twice the price. So with these sheetrock screws uh, all located and pulled out, I can unscrew the trimmer pull it out, trim the sheetrock, and stick it back in. It's a bittersweet moment, but the beloved cardboard door is coming down so that I can switch out this cripple. So sad. And I must have put a screw down in from the top when I built this. Yep, I did. Unfortunately, my big nippers are out on the job site, so I'll see if I can make do with what I have in the shop. I'll put an imprint in the shank of the screw with these small end cutters, and then rely on the brittleness of the screw to snap it off. Yeah, like that. And you think that 28 ounce hammer is big enough for a job like that? <laughs> well, you know how it goes. The rest of my ass doing collection is out on the job site. It's either irony or wrinkly that I don't have a one by four for a thinner cripple on the door opening, but it's also no big deal because I can just throw a rip blade in the table saw and make one. Plus, there's the added benefit that I can reuse the original screw holes. Although I failed to number the screws when I removed them so that they could be reinstalled right next to where they came out, I think they'll be okay as long as I get them on a simple guideline. Keep them out of the way when I trim the sheetrock back. A Bosch Multi-X Multi-Tool makes quick work of trimming back the bottom plate. You can see here that I've got a piece of composite decking. It acts as a spacer to hold this wood plate up off the concrete floor and allows breathing space underneath the wall for when the concrete floor gets washed. 
When I use the term quick work, keep in mind that that's relative. And I'm comparing it to having to do this with a hammer and a chisel like I would have had to in the days before multi-tools. Ever seen anybody use GRK construction screws for drilling into concrete? <laughs> Most people haven't. But there's a video link here if you want to see how and why I do that. And I'm always glad when an annoying little task like this is done. Modifying this rough opening in this sequence allows me to use a utility knife and score the sheetrock after the cripple's put in, rather than using a multi-tool, a sawzall, a jab saw, or a sheetrock saw for the same job, just because I think it's quicker, cleaner, and easier. Because I'm trimming off such a small amount, I scored the back of the sheetrock quite a few times to make sure I get a clean break. And that'll do the job. Other than 135,000 people out there on YouTube, nobody will ever know I had to do that. The last thing I'll do before taking this jam apart for uh, final sanding and varnish is to ease all the sharp edges. All these pieces were made with a joiner, a table saw, and a router, so they're very crisp and sharp, which is nice, but it's not a sustainable edge. It takes barely a bump, and a sharp edge like this will chip and fray, so I want to ease the edges. But there's a lot of them to do, so I want to do it quickly, efficiently, and uniformly. So rather than using a file or a sanding block to attack the edges, I grab a Bosch Colt router with a 1 16th inch radius roundover bit. And if you don't already use one of these to ease edges, I think you will from now on, once you see how slick this is. The part of this bit that does the cutting is so small, it's hard to even see it. But with a flush trim roller bearing on there, it's super slick, fast, and consistent. And the most difficult part of this is getting the depth set correctly because the difference between right and wrong is probably a 64th of an inch or less. So I take my best guess by eyeballing across the router base plate, but then I always run a test sample on a piece of scrap wood. And it's not unusual for it to take a few tries before I get it dialed in the way I want it. But this is just right. And once the bit is set up, I can quickly go around all the edges using a high RPM and a medium feed rate on the router. It can be a little tricky to balance the router on the three quarter inch wide edge of this jam, but with a little practice, it's pretty simple to do. And I'm able to keep the router from rocking without too much effort by using the little grippy finger pad on the router base and applying even pressure as I go. The half inch diameter guide bearing on the 16th inch roundover bit prevents the cutter from getting right into the sharp 90 degree corner. So I use a knife file to clean up this little detail. This knife file from McMaster Carr has a smooth back edge, which allows me to file right into the corner without over filing the opposite side. And a couple licks like that dials in that detail to perfection in just a few seconds. And to smooth everything here up before taking apart the jam, I use some 220 grit sandpaper on a gator sanding block to smooth these things off so they'll come out perfectly flush in the end. Because I did my homework and paid attention to sequence and machining as I went through all the steps for making this jam. I've got very little work to do at this stage. And just a few licks with 150 grit sandpaper, followed by 220 to make it nice and smooth. There's really nothing to it to get this ready for gel varnish. A jumbo oops eraser is great for cleaning up miscellaneous layout marks. It's come off much quicker if they're erased before they're sanded. Spots like this where there's a little bit of glue left on the jam are removed almost instantly with a sharp putty knife. And I scrape them off rather than sand them off because the sandpaper just drives the glue down into the pores of the wood. 150 grit sandpaper on this auto body and fender sanding block works great to remove any imperfections or streaking from the thickness planer. And then I chase it with 220 grit 
on this gator sanding block for an almost unbelievably smooth feel to the wood. And even though I've got a $1,500 Mercadero sander sitting right over there on the wall behind the camera, this hand sanding is all it takes. It's quicker, easier, and better, which is really making a statement for someone who dislikes sanding as much as I do. With everything cleaned up and sanded to 220, it's time to put the first coat of finish on it. Like I said earlier, I'm not going with uh, sprayed on uh, waterborne polyurethane. I'm going to use uh, Old Master's uh, gel poly on here. And I don't know about you, but to me, putting that first bit of finish on a project is a great motivator to continue through and get the job done because it goes from looking nice to looking fantastic in just a few seconds. This is the clear satin version of their uh, gel polyurethane. And it's one of the few finishes that I use that's applied by just globbing it on with a rag. This is that section of the jam with that weaving interwoven grain in the cherry. And I just love it the way it comes alive with the first wipe of this finish. Gel polyurethane is one of those foolproof kind of finishes. I just wab it on, let it soak a while, and when it starts to get tacky, uh, buff it down, wipe it off. I put the first couple coats of gel poly on this threshold for the thumbnail of the previous video, but to really take it home, I sanded this with 320 grit paper to remove nibs, and I'll add another coat here while I'm doing these other pieces because the threshold gets so much more wear and abuse, it'll do it good to have a few extra coats. After about an hour, I've got a full thick first coat on these pieces and I'll let them cure overnight before I hit them with that 320 and give them a second coat. You can tell the difference in the sheen between the threshold and the jam because the threshold has just got its second coat and the luster and sheen of the finish is more consistent and even over the surface. We'll take a break here while this finish is curing and say if you like the content of the video like this, I hope you'll subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. I try to pack content like this into every video and go deep into the weeds on the hows and the whys of the process rather than just glossing over it and showing you uh, what I can do and what it looks like when I do it. The first run through of this video will be a live premiere where I get to hang out with the audience uh, and watch the video play for the first time on YouTube. And as a little experiment, I'd like to check how many viewers are watching at this moment and then compare that to how many thumbs up the video has gotten so far. If there's a difference between the, uh, the two numbers, Let's do a countdown, and on three, everybody punch the thumbs up button, uh, assuming that you do like the video. So here's the countdown to punching the thumbs up button. Three, two, one, punch. Woohoo! I don't know what that does to YouTube, but it's a kick to see the number jump. Somewhere out there, there's a record for the highest number of thumbs up in the shortest period of time. and. Maybe we just got close. Anyways, thanks for doing that. I'll come back to this in the morning after this has had a chance to set up, scuff it down, and give it a second coat before final assembly of the jam. The gel varnish on these jams is finally dry enough to sand and put a second coat on it. It took a full 24 hours, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, people are sometimes kind and compliment me and say, oh, I wish I had your patience. Well. I'm not always the paragon of patience that you make me out for, and uh, finishing and varnish is something that I just, it frustrates me when it doesn't go well. I think I put a little bit too heavy of a coat on, I should have gone with a lighter coat, and then uh, I didn't leave the heat on in the shop enough overnight, so this morning this was still tacky, so I had to reorganize um, my whole day, did a bunch of other stuff, and uh, here I am getting over the frustration Give this a quick wipe with 320 grit uh, sandpaper and another coat of gel varnish. Once that coat dries, I'll finally be able to put this jam together once and for all and hang it in that rough opening. 
And this threshold is a couple steps ahead of the jam, but I just love the feel and the sheen on this piece. <whistles> Almost too pretty to use. You can tell when the gel varnish is dry enough for sanding because it'll chalk up a little bit. You can see that whiteness on there. That's varnish sanded. You can see this sandpaper has got little gummy smears all over it. Uh, those are from earlier today. A few times I, I tried to sand this to test and see if it was dry enough and it just gums up the paper. But it's good and ready now. The first coat of gel poly seals up the wood. So the second coat is kind of like a glamour coat. It doesn't have to be as thick and I'll buff it down right away per instructions to leave a beautiful finish on this jam. I'm starting out on this section with that wavy grain just because I think it looks so cool. And once again, that gel poly makes that grain come alive. And a little tip here I didn't show on the first coat. When you're putting gel varnish on, it can get glommed up in areas like hinges and holes where it gets glommed up in areas and you can't get it out with a rag. And I'm doing an extra sloppy job of this for the demonstration. But when it comes time to wipe the varnish down for the final buff and you can't get it out of those nooks and crannies, I just deploy a little compressed air and blow that extra varnish into a rag to clean it up. It works wonders and then I don't have those little lingering globs of glue stuck in the corners here and there to spoil the finished product. You can see in this panning shot what the freshly applied coat of gel poly looks like. It's a nice subtle sheen that dries unbelievably smooth. Some viewers have commented about using Bartley's gel varnish. I use Old Masters because I get it locally at my favorite paint store. It does a great job and imagine that Bartley's provides similar results for similar effort. After another 24 hours of cure time, the gel varnish on this jam is dry enough for me to put the jam together. You can see the sheen here on this part of the jam with the fascinating grain. And as wonderful as it is, I give it one final touch before assembling the jam. And for that, I use the world's finest sandpaper, which is nothing more than a brown paper bag. There's a video link over there for more about the world's finest sandpaper and what it does. But for here and now, I just give the jam a quick wipe to make this wonderful finish just a little more wonderful. Just for grins, I saved the little blocks I got when I notched out the ends of the threshold to interlock with the jam. And there's quite a bit of change in the blocks from one end of the threshold to the other. They look like a simple triangle and block, but there's a lot of tapering and contouring going around in those pieces. But you can see the subtle tapers in these blocks when they're flipped around. Other channels don't spend near as much time getting to this point in a build and then focus in on the assembly of the jam. But we've done our homework, so you know how this thing goes together. All I need to do is slip the biscuits in place, drive a few screws, and it's good to go. And I like the way the screw hole in the biscuit lines up when it's put back in the right place. I figure I might as well slip the weather strip in while I've got the door jam laying on the bench. After cutting the weather strip to length, it takes a little coaxing to get the barb started in the groove. And then I'll tap it into place with a softwood block and a rubber mallet. To get the best seal on the weather strip at the top corners, I snip back the barb about a half an inch and then actually miter the foam part of the weather strip before tucking it into the groove and tapping it into place. And it's surprisingly difficult to get that little barb started in the groove. But once it's started, I can tap it home for a perfect fit that's not going to fail. I removed the threshold again just because I could, because it makes trimming this weather strip to length so much easier and more predictable. It's a little more difficult and particular than I anticipated, but hey, that stuff is in there for good. And finally, with that persnickety weather stripping installed, I can do the final install of the threshold. Ta-da! 
because this threshold is going to be sitting on a concrete floor, I want to put a, a moisture barrier in between there. So I'm going to use a strip of this uh, EPDM rubber. This is basically like bicycle inner tube uh, rubber, eighth of an inch thick, uh, skinny eighth of an inch thick, tough as all can be, absolutely waterproof. So I'll custom fit that to the shape of the threshold. But before I forget, I want to show you that jam repair that got done with CA glue. And here's a super close up of that repair. You can see right down into that character mark or defect in the jam, but it's all solid because it's glued together. And with a couple coats of that gel poly on there, just makes a real interesting and attractive feature on this wood. And it'll be a subtle highlight for anyone looking close at the final installation. I'll just stand the jam up on this piece of EPDM rubber and then trace the profile of the threshold and the jam. And a regular carpenter pencil leaves a clear line that's easy to follow when trimming the rubber later. And I'll leave ears on the rubber at this point for when the new casing drops down to the floor, it'll sit on that rubber also. This rubber cuts quickly, cleanly, and easily with a decent pair of scissors. And I cut just inside the line so it doesn't show outside the threshold. And after final installation, I'll use silicone caulk to seal up the edge. I use a couple strips of double-sided tape to temporarily attach this rubber to the bottom of the threshold until the door is set in place and screwed down. A hard nylon roller applies firm pressure to make sure this double stick tape sticks to the rubber. And I chose to use this EPDM rubber instead of something like a peel and stick membrane because that would get glommed onto the bottom of the threshold and if I ever wanted to refinish it, it would be a real mess. But this double stick tape will always release for refinishing purposes if it's necessary. It's definitely unusual and borderline bizarre, but I decided to just flip the whole door jam upside down so I could lay the EPDM rubber on the other side of the threshold and get it positioned accurately before sticking it into place. And even after flipping the jam over and climbing on the table saw to attach that rubber, it was tricky to get it placed just so, and I was glad that I went through the extra effort because I don't think it would have turned out well if I tried some other arrangement. And that's perfect. And that's perfect. I decided to pre-fit the Sugatsuni concealed hinges in the jam before I stick the jam in the rough opening. I start out with a VIX bit for centering the holes for the four screws that hold the hinge to the jam. Because this is hardwood and the jam's extra thick, I chase those centered holes with a slightly bigger drill bit for a perfect pilot hole. And then I put a little dab of wax on the screw heads so that they don't snap off when I drive them. The hinges come with nice screw covers, but I won't install those just yet because I'll have to remove the hinge from this pocket when I install the door. I mentioned in a previous video that it's essential for this uh, rough opening to be perfect. Uh, there's no room for adjustment and twist with the way the casing attaches into the jam. And I've got my Bosch Greenline laser set up here. And the bright green beam from that laser shows that this opening is perfectly in plane. And my favorite four foot crick level shows that the hinge jam is dead on top to bottom. So that means all I need to do to set this jam is to drop it into place and drive a few screws. And I'll use these sweet feather shims that I make myself to install the door jam. Check out the link in the upper left hand corner of the screen. It'll take you to the video I did that shows how to make these shims. And I'll just slip a couple shims into the top corner of the jam to snug it into place so that I can align it up with the face of the sheetrock before driving screws. And I have to remember that this face of the jam is a finished surface, so I can't tap on it like normal because it won't get covered with casing. And because the hinge jam is plumb, I'll slip in a pair of shims at the bottom to hold it snug too. And I'm aligning this face of the jam with the sheetrock so that this casing will slide in when I go to install it. Everything about this jam is so beefy that I'll use GRK trim screws to install it with no worry of failure. I use a small piece of plastic as a protector for the weather stripping so I don't tear it up when I'm drilling the pilot hole. And this little gem is another snappy bit that's custom made for piloting for trim screws. And I'm using this number eight by three and a half inch uh, Torx drive trim screw for the installation. But when I hang the door on here, which is probably going to weigh 150 pounds, I'll probably back it up by driving a couple long screws in this top hinge.
Then I make sure the jam is lined up with the sheetrock at the bottom and drive a screw there too. Pressure from the shims and screws compress that trimmer stud ever so slightly. So I need to put a very slight shim in the middle because the jam has a slight bow in it. And that's where these feather shims that go down to virtually nothing come in great because I can easily shim a sixteenth of an inch without a fuss. And because I'm using screws to install this jam and not nails, I'll be able to do any minute shimming adjustments after the door is actually hanging in the frame because somehow things always seem to change. My top notch lighting crew took the night off, so you'll have to put up with some inferior lighting on these jam installation video clips. And you can see the perfect little trim screw sized countersink divot that that snappy bit makes. Because these screw heads are behind the weather strip, I won't fill them, but if they're somewhere that shows, I can easily fill those with putty or wax and make them disappear because there's no volcanoing around that screw head when it's driven. The shimming on this center screw will just be temporary and I'll dial in this leg of the jam to the edge of the door during the final installation. And again, because I'm using screws, it's no problem to dial it in for a perfect fit. Plus, those screws hold infinitely better than nails for a long-term solid installation for a heavy, heavy-use door like this. Once all the screws are in, I just take a sharp utility knife and trim the shims back flush with the jam edge so I can install the casing. And this is how the casing will look on a mitered corner once I actually make the casing and cut it to fit. I'll break off this episode here with those shims trimmed off because I'm excited about getting into making the actual door slab itself, which will be starting in episode number seven. Like I said in the beginning of the video, there's a whole lot of steps in between finishing up fabrication of a door jam and getting it installed in a rough opening. And with all that's involved, it's easy to understand why pre-hung doors are so much more practical and economical. All these steps are done mass produced in an assembly situation somewhere, uh, the door shows up on a job site, the carpenter just has to cut off a couple of uh, straps, a few pieces of cardboard, and install the jam. I've been six episodes getting to this point, and that same thing could be done in 20 minutes by going somewhere and buying a pre-hung door. But I hope that the end result of a custom, one-of-a-kind door made from scratch, from pallet wood, is worth it. Observant viewers might have noticed that I've switched to a different t-shirt for the outro segment of the video and that's because this is a new design for next level carpentry at Teespring. I got the quote on the back that says how you do anything is how you do everything. I uh, got that quote from a viewer who put that quote in a comment and I thought that would make a perfect t-shirt and if that viewer will contact me I'll work it out so you can get a free t-shirt with your quote on it. For anybody else, uh, on this Valentine's Day weekend, Teespring has a 10% off everything discount. I'll put the code for that in the video description, so you'll have one day to take advantage of it if you're after this t-shirt or any of the other stickers, signs, or posters from Next Level Carpentry. The list of viewers who've gone above and beyond to support Next Level Carpentry by becoming a patron at Patreon continues to grow. And I really appreciate that. Every bit of support there makes my goal of making Next Level Carpentry my full-time job so I can produce more quality content more often uh, brings that a little closer to reality. So I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Episode number seven is going to get into uncharted territory. I'm building a door unlike any I've ever built and I don't see this style or design anywhere, much less a tutorial on how to make a door like that out of pallet wood no less. So I hope you'll stay tuned as those episodes roll out to see how that plan comes together. I'm at a bit of a crossroads where it comes to making trim. Uh, the casing for this door is going to be an episode or two uh, to show how that's done. And the reason I'm at a crossroads on the trim is that this profile can be made a number of different ways. It can be made pretty straightforward uh, using a table saw to make the cove or it can be done with a molder and a custom ground knife. I'm hoping I get to show you both of those methods, but at a minimum, I'll run it on the Williams and Hussey molder that I've had for about 20 years. What I'm hoping to do is to collaborate with Williams and Hussey and get one of their latest model machines that has a multi-pass function, a better dust chute and stuff than the machine I have. 
and I'm in discussion with them to do an unboxing video and then showing uh, a number of different examples of how wonderfully that machine makes professional molding with minimal setup time at a fraction of the cost of a big commercial molding machine. So I'm going to ask you for another favor and this one's a little unique. I'll be talking to Williams and Hussey next week and we're not quite sure how the collaboration would look when it's done but I'm going to put a link in the video description and anybody that's curious to see a Williams and Hussey molder in action to see it unboxed here in the Next Level Carpentry Shop if you'll use that link go to Williams and Hussey and just send an email to Mr. Carter there. I think it'd be fun if he had an inbox full of emails from Next Level Carpentry viewers next week when we talk about the particulars of collaborating to show that machine at work in this shop. So again there's a link in the uh, description Anybody that's willing or motivated to uh, send an email to Williams and Hussey and express your interest in their machine and its capabilities, shoot off an email and we'll see what kind of impact that has. Okay? Thanks. All right. Well, uh, that's enough of that. I got to cut this off, uh, get this video into the computer, edited it up so that I can do a premiere of this video tonight for all you guys. I'm looking forward to that. But I got to get going. So until next time, as always, Thanks for watching. And I'm kind of curious what the impact is on you, the audience for Next Level Carpentry. When you hear all this talk and see all these steps for making a door out of solid cherry, even though it's pilot wood, and then how to install $150 worth of Sugitsune concealed hinges, and then I go and hang a piece of recycled cardboard on those hinges. And to top that off, I walk out of here with a t-shirt that says, how you do anything is how you do everything? Oh boy.